yeah, you know what that music means. Hey, everybody, welcome to Chase for the Championship. A lot of stuff to get to in this week's show. We got records being broken, teams coming off of shutdowns and showing out, and teams going into shutdowns. Some of them kind of on the court if you look at the scores. So sit back, get ready. Going to be a fun ride here, but let's check out these standings. We've got a new leader atop the ACC. Yeah, 13th rank. UVA maintains a half game lead over rival Virginia Tech. After Louisville took two losses this week, Florida State and Pitt round out that top four. Georgia Tech continues to have a solid season under fourth year head coach Josh Pastner. We got some stuff from him. And uh, yeah, they're uh, in fifth in the ACC right now. Louisville, Duke, and UNC, three teams you'd expect at the top follow the Yellow Jackets. Clemson, it's dropped its last two ACC games. Kind of tough down there in South Carolina. After winning its previous three, they're just having some issues. Syracuse and NC State sit just under 500, followed by the struggling Hurricanes. Man, they got a lot of guys hurt. Yeah, Canes struggling, but so is Notre Dame, Boston College, and Wake Forest. So they got a little company. Demon Deacons here now the only winless team in conference play. In North Carolina, oh, they're learning its identity as the season goes along. The Tar Heels are getting more and more contributions from their freshmen. And as WNCN's Alyssa Ray explains, that made the difference in last night's win over Wake Forest. Alyssa? Hey there, Chris. North Carolina seemed to be hitting its stride, winning three straight games before losing at Florida State by seven points. But they gave Carolina fans hope again last night against Wake Forest. The Tar Heels won 80 to 73, and it was another outing in which the freshmen shined. Three scored in double figures against the Seminoles, and Caleb Love and R.J. Davis both showed up offensively again against the Demon Deacons. Love led the team with 20 points. Davis had 13. Love said after the game he's been going through a slump, but that the support of his family, practice, and some meditation, he was able to snap out of it. Uh, seven for 12 tonight is by far, I think, the best game he's had from the floor. Uh, I do think he's getting better. I told him yesterday or the day before uh, we had a little meeting, and I told him that uh, I think he's getting better a little bit each and every day, and we just got to keep getting him some opportunities. We're always in the gym and uh, just, just staying true to my work. Um, I, uh, just because of my shot not falling doesn't mean I stop working. I'm going to keep working and then I, I started meditating like a few weeks ago. Uh, that, that's helping me. I'm um, talking to my mom and dad, uh, coaches, having meetings with them, uh, telling them keep keep their confidence in me. And uh, my teammates just, just building me up. Armando Baycott said after the game, they haven't played a complete game as a team yet, but it'll be interesting to see their potential once they do. Covering the Tar Heels, I'm Alyssa Ray. Thank you, Alyssa. And congrats to North Carolina guard R.J. Davis, selected as the ACC Freshman of the Week. Davis averaged 14 points, two assists per game as North Carolina took down Syracuse. They did fall at Florida State, but stay with me here. Davis, 9 for 17 from the field, including 4-9 from three-point range Saturday at FSU. Tied a season high and led UNC with 16 points. Uh, he was a season-best 6 for 9 from the floor, had a season-best three assists with just one turnover. Scored 12 points, led UNC with a plus-14 rating in the win over the Qs. He made two three-pointers against the Orange, including one with 10.47 to play that sparked that 13-0 UNC run after the Orange had taken its largest lead of the game at 56-51. He had no turnovers in almost 22 minutes. That's huge. Made a pair of free throws with 21 seconds remaining to seal the win. Congratulations. Next up for the heels, a date with a heated rival. Talking NC State. Tip-off for that is at 2 p.m. Speaking of North Carolina, how about rookie Cole Anthony? NBA rookie Cole Anthony is 15 games into his NBA career. The former Tar Heels point guard hit a game-winning three for his Orlando Magic to give them a win over the Minnesota Timberwolves. Cole making dad proud, I bet. Making a lot of fans proud, too. For that one. And if there's one thing that uh, college coaches love, it's athletes who play more than just one sport. There's just something special about an athlete who can excel at multiple sports. NC State will have that type of player on campus next season. Todd Gibson caught up with Reedsville star beyond pass for this week's edition of Chase for the Championship. NC State's in-state recruiting has been spot on recently, and next year the Wolfpack will bring in at least a couple more in-state recruits, including a two-sport star from Reedsville High School who is just too tough to pass up on. Reedsville star guard Breon Pass formed a comfort level with NC State head coach Kevin Keats. Above all else, there was one thing Pass was looking for when it came down to his college choice. Family, uh, Coach Keats, Coach Johnson, uh, they've recruited me since freshman year, so it feel like family to me. 
surpasses having a monster senior season, averaging 35 points per game and double-digit rebounds. But not long ago, many felt football was Pass's best sport. Wolfpack head coach Dave Doran tried his hardest to get Pass to play football at stage after the Rams receiver hauled in 13 touchdown passes a year ago. Breon's a once-in-a-lifetime athlete. He's all-state football, all-state basketball. Um, I think he just followed his heart in basketball is what he's been doing since he was a small child. Pass is the sixth-ranked player in North Carolina and the 12th best combo guard nationwide. He says that toughness he learned on the gridiron will serve him well when it's time to do battle in the ACC. I'm a uh, team leader. I'm really aggressive. Uh, I lock in on defense, offense, really just getting everybody involved. So, and I'm a uh, winner. And Breon has been playing football since he was seven years old, but he has decided to pass up on his senior year of football to concentrate on basketball. Following the Wolfpack in Raleigh, I'm Todd Gibson. Thank you, Todd. That game with UNC, like we were talking about, is this Saturday at 2 p.m. Next time you can catch the pack after that on the court. It's going to be Wednesday when they take on Wake Forest. BNC Arena tip-off is set for 8 p.m. in that go-round. Last night, the NC State Wolfpack were supposed to take on Virginia, but COVID shut that one down. Second game this month to get put on hold for Tony Bennett's league-leading squad. Covering the Cavaliers for us is WRIC's Natalie Calibut. She joins us now with more from Charlottesville. Natalie? The Virginia Cavaliers are the only undefeated team left in ACC play. UVA picked up an impressive 35 point win at Clemson on Saturday, but they've had to wait to take the floor again after Wednesday's game at NC State was postponed. When you feel like you have a, a rhythm, you'd like to keep playing, but um, that is what it is this year more than ever. And so you can't, you just can't control that. Tony Bennett hoped to find a replacement game, but was unable to do so on short notice. There's just such a inconsistency. We have to sit out 10 days if there's contact tracing. Some are sitting seven, some are 14. There's a lot of variations going on um, in the way people look at it, you know, when they can play, when they can't. Even in these darker times, Bennett has found rays of light. The thing it's taught me is hope, to rely on hope because the present is so uncertain. You don't know, you know, you wait here, all right, well, all the tests negative, here we go. And you have to deal with a lot of uncertainty. So you're always just hopeful. Things will get busy again quickly. UVA hosts Georgia Tech on Saturday and Syracuse on Monday. Covering Virginia, I'm Natalie Calabat. Thank you, Natalie. Cavaliers next opponent, those Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. After four straight postponements, Tech finally got on the court against Clemson last night and exploded for an incredible game. They took down the Tigers 83-65. Three players for the Yellow Jackets scored more than 20 points. Jackets built a nine-point halftime lead, pulled away after the break to hand the Tigers their second straight blowout loss. Coach Passer was worried how his guys would respond after taking so much time off. It was obvious that was not an issue. Great win, playing a, you know, a very, very good Clemson team, uh, top 20 team in the country. Um, and obviously coming off of a 17 day layoff. So you don't know what's how you're going to be, but you know, we really played well. We played the right way. It was just something that we prepared well for. Um, we were shooting a lot in practice, getting a lot of shots. on, getting a lot of reps in playing game speed type of um, situation. So um, it's a home court advantage. We should be able to shoot the lights out at our home court. So um, it was a great one. We shot the lights out, like you said, and it was just a great overall team win. Tucker, Virginia getting together in Charlottesville. It's coming Saturday. Tip time is set for 8 p.m. in that one. And after a pair of blowout losses, the Syracuse Orange put it together and just unloaded on Miami earlier this week, beating the Hurricanes 83 to 57. Let's check in with WSYR's Steve Infante for more on how the Q's plan to use this win to get things rolling in the dome. And they got some help coming back as well to the court. Well, we've seen up and down play from the Orange throughout the last several weeks, especially at the guard position, and now we have a big piece to that puzzle. Jim Beheim mentioning in his postgame press conference Tuesday night that both his son Buddy and Joe Girard are working their way back from a positive COVID diagnosis. This is the first we've heard from the university about who was affected during the team's latest pause that started right before Christmas. Girard was then, of course, asked about it after the Miami game. He confirmed he tested positive, but didn't want to use that as an excuse. He knew he had to play better, and on Tuesday, he was better. Both JG3 and Buddy Beheim tied for game high honors with 23 points, a good sign that they're getting closer to 100%. Both Joe and, and Buddy were out with it, so they were out. They were sick and they were out. So people forget. Everybody knows this happens and knows that they were, but then they expect them to come back and play like nothing ever happened. 
Uh, it just doesn't work that way. You know, I was in quarantine smelling hot sauce and I couldn't even smell it. Uh, so it was just, just some stuff like that. But uh, I was pretty sick, uh, you know, having asthma, my parents and, uh, you know, staff's pretty worried about it. Uh, but, you know, healthy kid, you know, college athlete and, uh, you know, pretty healthy. The Orange will need both Joe and Buddy to play like that again on Saturday when SU welcomes 11 and 2 Virginia Tech to the Carrier Dome for a noon start. Covering Syracuse, I'm Stephen Fonte. Thank you, Steve. Like you said, next up, Virginia Tech Hokies in the Dome. Tech having to deal with cancellation of their game last night with Boston College. Uh, for the latest, let's go to WFXR's David DeGuzman, keeping us up to speed on the Hokies. David. The Virginia Tech men's basketball team moved up four spots from 20 to 16 in the latest Associated Press poll. Tech now one of three ACC teams in the rankings, and the Hokies scheduled to have two games this week, but they could only complete half of that mission. Well, last Sunday, the Hokies beating Wake Forest 64 to 60. Hokies game at Castle on Wednesday against Boston College postponed because of COVID-19 issues in the Eagles program. Tech improving to 11 and two overall and five and one in the ACC. So a strong start for the Hokies and things are looking up for that team. Redshirt sophomore Tyrese Radford earning ACC co-player of the week, averaging 19 points and eight rebounds over the past week. He had a double double 18 points, 12 boards in the win against Duke, and that was followed by a 20 point performance over Wake Forest. So. Tech off to that 5 and 1 start in the ACC for just the second time since joining the conference back in 2004. It's year two of the Mike Young era for Virginia Tech men's basketball and last season he finished with a limited roster 16 and 16. This year though the Hokies off to an 11 and 2 start and again 5 and 1 in the ACC and three of those wins were against ranked teams. So the team in a very good place with the season ahead. There's still lots of basketball to be played but the Hokies now have have an identity that Coach Young likes with his young team. You know, the team creates it, uh, and I, uh, I push it uh, every day. You know, uh, this is Virginia Tech, and I, um, I get text often from Bud Foster and Coach Beamer. Um, you know, I want to think about, um, you know, that identity and the de defensive end and grit and, you know, tough and hard-nosed and, and this team is that. Um, I don't know that I had a, uh, you know, a, an aha moment. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is it. It's something that evolves. I never think we're very good uh, early. You know, July, August uh, through September, October. I'm not sure. You know, we're going to win a game and uh, just. Uh, but, you know, um, Villanova was a. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, an enormous step. Uh, we really guarded them. They shot 42% from the field. And then uh, ACC opener in here against a really good Clemson team. Um, we really guarded. We limited Clemson to 36%. Uh, we were bad on the glass last night. But, man, have we been, uh, we've been really, really good in that, uh, in that area. Uh, Duke is Duke. And, um, you know, we touched those guys up uh, on the glass uh, pretty well. Uh, Radford at... Uh, you know, at the at the guard spot is such a, you know, just such a worker uh, on uh, both glasses. I mean, he comes up with balls. It's like scratch your head. Like, how in the world did he? You know, how how, how do you get that ball? Um, so, you know, I I do think that there is a great buy-in, and it doesn't matter, Aaron. I I run my mouth all I want, and if they don't buy it and uh, live it uh, every day. You know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, matter, but um, uh, they, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having the best time uh, uh, working with this uh, team. It is a team. Uh, don't care who gets the credit. Um, you know, they're going to adhere to who they are. They're tough people. So the Hokies developing a strong identity in mid-January and Virginia Tech just a half a game behind the top spot in the ACC, certainly becoming a contender in this league. Covering the Virginia Tech Hokies, I'm David DeGuzman. Thank you, David. Good stuff. And after dispatching ACC teams left and right, the Louisville Cardinals ran into a bit of a problem with teams from the Sunshine State. Back-to-back -back games, the Miami Hurricanes and Florida State Seminoles put up 78 on the cards and handed them L's in the process. There are only two ACC losses thus far. WHT's Randall Parmley checks in with what's going on with the Cardinals. Randall. 
It has been a rough stretch for Louisville against teams from the Sunshine State. Back-to-back -back losses for the Cards at Miami and then at home against Florida State. Now, Louisville traveled to Coral Gables on Saturday and lost to the Hurricanes 78-72. Let's be honest, this was a bad loss for the Cards as Miami picked up only their second conference win of the season. Louisville was down 12 at halftime and made it a game in the second, but they never could really get over the hump. One key to that loss, Louisville was ice cold from three, going only three of 20. It was back at home on Monday and another loss, this time to Florida State, 78-65. The Seminoles broke it open with a 17-3 first half run and was simply the better team at the Yum Center. It was the Seminoles' fourth straight win against the Cards, their longest winning streak in the series since the 68-69 season. Now Louisville continues a three-game homestand this weekend when they host Duke on Saturday. Covering the Louisville Cardinals, I'm Randall Parmley. Thank you, Randall. And like you said, the Cards' next opponent, the Duke Blue Devils, fresh off their matchup with Pitt, a little battered and bruised. Pitt Panthers were more than aggressive with those baby Blue Devils, and I don't think they were quite ready for it. Okay, stop me when you think you've heard this before about Duke. They fell behind early, played catch up all night long. Pitt stretched the lead to 15 at one point in the second half before the Blue Devils made a charge to cut it to a bucket, but they never could take over the top spot again. It ruined a great night from freshman Jalen Johnson, by the way, who recorded his second double double this season with a career high 24 points, 15 rebounds, and Career high seven assists. No turnovers either. Not a bad night. For his first game back to have, I don't know, he almost had 20 and 20 again. I mean, that's pretty impressive for somebody who's been out that long with that kind of injury. Uh, I mean, the stuff he brings to our team is uh, one like no other. It's been good getting back uh, tonight. Uh, was a tough, tough loss, of course, but uh, I'm not worried about the production. My production is doing whatever it takes to help uh, us win. Uh, Clearly, uh, we just got to do more as a team. The most disappointing thing for me was our start. We have practiced so hard and tried different things. And for us, to, for me to have to call a timeout after two minutes it is not acceptable. Now, when you think about Coach K and Duke basketball, the image that comes to my mind is that tough man-to-man -man floor slapping defense that helped them win most of his titles. It's why so we're surprised to see Duke come out against Pitt in a zone. Now, not that Coach hasn't done that before. I mean, 2015 comes to mind when they made the switch after NC State and Miami pick and rolled them apart, and Coach had to stop it somehow. But eh, 2015 ended up being a pretty good year for Duke basketball, too, by the way, if you remember. But with how things are going, it looks like Coach is back to tinkering with his team to find something that'll work. We work on the zone all week, uh, really. I'm after Virginia Tech in. That's something that we uh, put in. Uh, it, and I mean, I think for the most part, we are doing a pretty good job at it. Uh, we need to talk a little more, uh, be a little more active in the zone. We're going to need some zone going forward because we're not a big team. We're not a physical team. And the thing we need to learn how to do from it is when we're in it, don't allow dribble penetration and then rebound, you know, rebound from it. But, uh, you know, I thought ov overall it was, it, 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 it was good. <laughs> it wasn't great, but it was, it was good. And it's something that we can work on to go forward. And it, you know, with the small perimeter that we have, it lends itself to that zone. Blue Devils square off with Louisville Saturday at the KFC Yum Center. Tip off, like we said before, set at 4 p.m. The next time we're going to see them on the court is Tuesday when they take on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. That one is in the friendly confines of Cameron Indoor. Another late tip for that one as well. Meanwhile, the Clemson Tigers were looking to rebound from a 35-point blowout home loss to Virginia when they headed to Atlanta to take on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. The Tigers figured they had shaken off the rust that, uh, after that long layoff they had. Georgia Tech, they look more rested than rusty, man. I mean, for more of the Tigers and where they go from here, though, we're going to turn to WSPA's Pete Yannity. Pete? 
For the first time this season, the Clemson Tigers heading into the weekend, having lost back to back games coming off of an 83 65 defeat at Georgia Tech in which the Jackets pretty much started to pull away late in the first half, led by nine to the break and then a drought of more than four minutes out of the locker room to start the second half. Pretty much doomed a Clemson team that played well enough offensively to win despite 20 turnovers. They did shoot better than 50% from the field and were really good from beyond the arc, making nine of 18. However, Georgia Tech was blistering at over 60% on three pointers and well up in the high 50s in terms of field goal percentage and coming off a blowout loss at home against Virginia the previous Saturday in Little John Coliseum after the game. Brad Brownell was asked if his team's effort was there on the defensive end. I don't think it was a lack of effort. I thought our effort really waned in the uh, Virginia game. I thought we had trouble guarding the ball for a while and so we got put in rotations and obviously if you got to have two to help on the ball then somebody's open if they move it quick enough and these guys are such good passers that you know, I thought that was a big part of our problem initially. So Clemson, which entered the game ranked 20th against a Georgia Tech team that hadn't played since the 3rd of January, suffers a third loss overall in the season, all in the ACC. They're 3-3 three and three as they get ready for a trip to Tallahassee, taking on a Florida State team Saturday they knocked off in Little John Coliseum earlier this season. Covering the Clemson Tigers, I'm Pete Yannity. Thank you, Pete. Tigers in Tallahassee Saturday, like you said, 3 p.m. tip. And to get a look at how the Knowles will put a stop to the Tigers, we're going to turn to our woman who is always in the know, WMBB's Courtney Mims with the latest on Florida State. Courtney. Florida State didn't have much time to celebrate their win on Saturday over UNC because they had to head to Louisville to take on the Cardinals on Monday night. But the quick turnaround didn't seem to bother the Knowles as they came away with a win in this one, 78 to 65 over the Cardinals. With the victory, the Knowles improved to 8 and 2 on the season and 4 and 1 in the ACC. It was also FSU's fourth straight win over Louisville, which is the longest winning streak over them in program history. It was Raekwon Gray who had an outstanding performance for the team with 17 points, 8 rebounds and 2 assists. But the whole squad had an impressive night from the floor, shooting 50% overall and around 43% from behind the arc. Florida State head coach Leonard Hamilton said after the game he thinks this team still has plenty of room to grow. We learned that we have some strengths. We're shooting the ball well from the perimeter. We, we're not moving the ball and executing in the half court nearly as much as well as I think we should. Um, I, I think that we're not really taking advantage of maybe some of our strengths, but that's kind of who we are. We're still growing. Some areas we experience, some areas we're not. You know, we're just still trying to put it together. Still got some growing to do. The Seminoles are now getting ready for their next challenge, the number 20 Clemson Tigers on Saturday at home, a team that Florida State fell to back at the end of December by just 10 points. Reporting on Florida State, I'm Courtney Mims. Thank you for the update again. Tip time for the Tigers and Knowles, 3 p.m. The next time we're going to see the Knowles in action is going to be the following Wednesday when they play host the in-state rival Miami. Tip off for that will be at 6 p.m. in the Donald L. Tucker Center. And the last time we saw the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, they were taking down the Boston College Eagles and finally getting that all-elusive first ACC win. Their Monday game with Howard University, however, was canceled. So what have they been up to in the meantime? That's why we turn to WXIN's Chris Whitlick for the latest. Chris. COVID issues have made Notre Dame basketball season, like so many others, a choppy, unsettled mess. The Irish were set to become the first Power 5 program to visit Howard an HBCU in a decade and play a nationally televised contest on the Martin Luther King holiday. But the game was canceled. That makes three canceled contests, along with two postponements for the Irish, but the head coach knows this one of the nation's capital will eventually happen. We're going to do it next year. We will be there in 2022. Uh, I, I'm, I'm disappointed because I think it was going to be an unbelievable story, uh, especially given what's going on in our country and everything that's happened in the last week, and, and really an educational opportunity for my players as we – aligned with when we all vote in the Howard guys. There was some really cool stuff that happened, but we're going to play it next year and, and picture it next year. Picture it in 2022. MLK Day, packed house, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be in that gym. I guarantee it. By the way, the vice president is a Howard alum. 
Breeze Irish were able to earn ACC win number one with a 10-point victory over Boston College in South Bend last weekend. Just a 4 and 8 start overall, but the veteran team should get better starting with a visit to Miami on Sunday. Covering the Irish for Chase, I'm Chris Woodlick. Thank you, Chris. I wouldn't mind tickets to that one now. Tell me where to sign up. Meanwhile, the Miami Hurricanes still trying to figure things out. After beating a tough Louisville team, they followed up by falling hard to a Syracuse squad on the road. And then short and sweet, uh, Hurricanes don't match up well with a zone defense. I mean, they got the people that can penetrate, but they don't have the players that can make the shots once the defense collapses and they get, you know, the ball kicked out to them. Once again, I mean, they struggle from beyond the arc. 0 for 11 first half, 4 for 25 for the game. You throw in 17 turnovers, you're not going to win many games like that. Good news is they did get senior guard Cameron McGusty and freshman wing Earl Timberlake back. Senior guard Chris Likes, though, still out. Just a tough run for the Hurricanes, who would be formidable if they were healthy. We're going to need to do a better job because I'm sure we're going to see a lot more zone in the uh, second half of the season. We've just completed our 13th game. and We're only playing 25 this year, so... We're actually halfway to the finish line. The nice thing is we're still getting to play. We haven't had COVID-related stops. At least they're safe from COVID issues. That's something. Next up for the Canes that day with the Fighting Irish on Sunday. Tip-off set for 6 p.m. in Coral Gables. And there's a line from a country song that says, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And while it's just a fictional song, the Boston College Eagles seem to be living it right now. After losing four straight, they shook their losing streak by beating Miami. They lost to Notre Dame, but they played the Fighting Irish tough. Looked like they were turning a corner and ready to start putting up some wins. But Saturday, we got word their game with Virginia Tech was canceled due to COVID issues in the Eagles program. Okay, fine. Quarantine test. Get ready for a shot at the Pitt Panthers Saturday night coming up, right? Then we got word late last night that that game has been postponed as well. Again, if it weren't for bad luck, no luck at all. How are you holding up there, Coach? You know, just the uncertainty of everything, I think, is pretty tough. Um, you know, every time you take a test, you're hoping you play. You know, so that's kind of diminishes the, um, the anticipation of games or, or players. But I think it's, you know, overall, I think our team, most of the teams, I think, if you ask them, um, have done a really good job with, with just being patient and, and uh, understanding and, and appreciating the times that they do get to play. But I, I think it's definitely uncertain. And, and the atmosphere at the games is just totally unique. Yeah, it really is. It's, 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 you miss it. You know what I mean? You miss, I, I feel bad for the kids, especially like we have a, a couple, we have a fifth year kid in Rich Kelly who's going to play a year in the ACC and never experience that. I mean, that's, that's why you come to these schools. Um, uh, you obviously want to play against the best, but you also want to play in the, in the, in the venues that give you the most memories. And, and that's, um, I feel bad for a guy like that who's not going to get that opportunity. Again, this Saturday's game between Pitt and Boston College postponed, follows that positive test, subsequent quarantine and contact tracing, et cetera, et cetera, Boston College men's basketball program. Next time uh, we were going to see the Eagles take the court was next Tuesday when they were set to play Clemson, but today that game was actually moved back one day. Tip-off for that one is set for 9 p.m., so they're going to play it just a day later. And while we're talking about Pitts, uh, of all the former Duke players that have gone on to coach college basketball, none of them have ever come back to play against and beat their old coach, Mike Krzyzewski, until last night. It's when former Duke standout Pitt Panthers coach Jeff Capel topped his former coach 79-73. Just builds off a great January where the Panthers are a perfect 3-0. 4-1 in conference play overall, 8-2 overall. The Panthers snapped the four-game losing skid against the Blue Devils, jumping out to an 8-0 lead and just continually applying the pressure all over the court. Justin Champagne tied a career high with 31. Audis Tony scored 13 of his 22 from the foul line, had 11 rebounds for Pitt. Xavier Johnson added nine points, career high 11 assists. Scary team when those guys can all get them on the court at once. We are going to continue to keep this up and, and, and try our best and work hard and, and, and just – take everything that, that's not given to us. Like, we feel like we're not giving a lot of credit in this league, and we want to go out there and show why we deserve the credit that, that, that we earn. We want to be a team that fights. We, we've done it in different ways this year. We, we've had to come back. You know, we've had two games where we didn't lead until the last 10 seconds of the game. You know, we've, we've had some games now, this game, Miami, where we've led for, you know, a good part of the game. Um, and so, again, you know, we're a team that's still growing, still trying to get better, but we have to understand 
you know, that, that it's a fight. In order to be, it's hard to be good. It's hard. And there's a certain level of commitment, of, of discipline, of, of, you know, all these things that have to happen. And we're learning how to do that. We're not there yet. We're not good yet. You know, we're becoming good. I don't know. I'd say they're pretty good. Like I said earlier, a big win, not just for the Pitt Panthers record, but for the first time, a former player from Duke returned to take on and take down Coach K. He's had one assistant beat him. Think about that. That's been a head coach, I mean, ever since 1975 when he started at Army. Got to Duke in 80. That's 45 years. Think about the players that came through his locker rooms. I mean, on the flip side, Capel's players wanted it for him as well, even if Capel said he didn't. I, I, I feel like we, we owed them a win. We owed, we owed them a win since last year. You know, we, we lost at their house by, by not a lot. And after that, I felt like we, we could have beat them last year. So as a team, I feel like we all wanted, like, we all wanted it equally. Like everybody in the locker room really, really wanted to win this game. And it just felt good to do it. Well, one of the things that I learned there is, is, is uh, you know, you have to fight. That's, that's the foundation that that program is built on. You know, from Dawkins, Allery, Villas, Henderson, Amaker, and then you go from that class on, you know, that class, Amaker joined them a year later. They were the ones that taught the lessons. All right, checking the list of guys here in the Wayback Machine. Mike DeMint, Duke assistant, 82 to 83, went to coach Cornell five years, bringing his team to Cameron twice, lost then. He was at UNCG from 05 to 11, played Duke four times, lost them as well. He was replaced by UNCG uh, at North Carolina by Wes Miller midseason. They played, Duke beat them also is the point I was trying to make. Chuck Swenson, Coach K's first Duke staff. He stayed at Duke till 87, went to William & Mary for seven years. He's over. Tim O'Toole, Duke assistant from 95 to 97. He went to Coach Fairfield. They came back. They lost by 30 each time. And then Johnny Dawkins. They faced each other November 2014, Coaches v. Cancer Classic. Dawkins was a head man at Stanford and in the NCAAs as well when he was at UCF. Last second shot rimmed out, though, still over. Tommy Amaker, Michigan and Duke played a home and home series. Amaker's first two seasons with the Wolverines, Duke swept them both. Quinn Snyder, now he went on to some great NBA fame, but he was a player and six year assistant for Coach K. Faced him in 2001, the NCAA tournament, lost that one 94 81. When Duke won it all that year, by the way. And man of the hour, Jeff Capel. Never faced Coach K while at VC or Oklahoma. Now in the ACC, he's faced him three times. Picked up his first win last night. Mike Bray, this is the only guy that is breaking the mold here. He was on the Duke bench from 87 to 95. Took the head job at Delaware. Traveled to Duke first season. Lost by six. Then he moved to Notre Dame. Lost to Coach K in the second round of the 2 NCAA tournament. And after joining the ACC, the Fighting Irish came in. They went on a run where the Irish actually won five of six, including the only win by a former assistant at Cameron Indoor. That one came in 2016. And some congratulations are in order for good sophomore forward Justin Champagne. Not just for the work he put in against Duke, but for being named one of the ACC co-players of the week for the work he put in leading up to this game last night. Champagne, the first ACC player of the week honor to earn the player of the week honors twice. He also claimed the distinction in December the 14th. Uh, might be in line for third if he keeps this up. Scored 24 points, pulled down 16 rebounds Saturday in Pitt's 96-76 triumph over Syracuse. Returning to action for the first time since suffering that knee injury, by the way. He recorded his fourth double-double and fourth 2010 game of the season. Champagne was expected to miss 68 weeks following knee injury, but returned after missing just four and just two games with a lot of COVID, you know, cancellations there, postponements. Finished that game uh, 9 of 18 from the field, 6 of 7 from the foul line as the Panthers completed the regular season sweep of Syracuse. That's on top of the game he put up last night at Duke where he dropped 31 and 14. Just a sophomore. Uh, this guy is player of the year candidate as well if he keeps this up. He had a little extra motivation last night in this one. You see Duke's Matthew Hurt was also being talked about as a potential player of the year. Uh, Justin definitely used that as fuel. Take a listen. Yeah, definitely. I, before the game, I, I kept saying to myself, I don't think that he, he's better than me. And I went out there and I kind of proved it. <laughs> it's the head nod and the smile. That <laughs> makes me grin. Uh, I tell you, with the game between the Panthers and the Eagles postponed, the ACC has moved up a date with Wake Forest from February to this Saturday. So the Panthers are going to take on the Demon Deacons at 6 in Winston-Salem. For more on how the Demon Deacons are holding up through all of this, let's turn to WGHP's Danny Harden for the latest. Danny. 
So the Wake Forest Deacons have now lost six straight games, all ACC games. The latest defeat Wednesday night at North Carolina was tough to take because the Deacons were playing well, had the lead at halftime, a couple of bright spots, 27 points from Davian Williamson and 27 points from Isaiah Musius. But when you look at the stat sheet, the thing that stood out, 20 turnovers. North Carolina took advantage to post an 87-3 win over the Deacons. After the game, Roy Williams told Wake coach Steve Forbes how much he respected the job he was doing with the Deacons. But for Forbes? Uh, it feels good, but it doesn't feel good to lose. And, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to be the most liked guy in the league because we're losing. You know, that's not what I want to be here for. And, um, but I appreciate it, you know, but I feel for my team. You know, I, I feel I got to do more to help them. I got to coach them better. They can't play much harder. They're playing hard, man. And you're talking about we're in these games close and we're literally plays away from making this turnaround. And I think the whole team sees it. I think the coaching staff sees it. And I think probably a lot of people that watch these games see that we're a couple plays away, a little box out, a, a turnover, um, a loose ball away from being that team that can turn the corner. And I feel for my players because they battle, they try hard, and, and they're and they're hurting. Uh, but you know, I've told them this: I think good things happen when you keep playing hard and reward the game the way it should be rewarded. And I believe that good things are around the corner for this team as long as we keep together and keep fighting. Mucius had hit only four three pointers all season, but hit seven threes against the Tar Heels. Again, Wake's not getting blown out in these defeats. They just need to protect the ball a little better and make the big plays in crunch time. Reporting on the Deacons, I'm Danny Harnden. Well, lots of scheduling and changes and rescheduling going on this week, and we have uh, proven teams taking on teams that are really just getting going after some really long layoffs. So how does this affect the odds? Well, to make sense of it all, we bring on Jason Logan from Covers.com. And Jason, starting off here, Duke and Louisville, they meet up Saturday. But if you went by the rankings, this isn't the biggest game in the ACC. What's happened to these perennial favorites, and which team has the best chance to get it right? Yeah, so the Blue Devils right now, they're, they're giving up more than 72 points per game on the year, and opponents are picking up 30% of those points from beyond the arc. So Duke is allowing ACC foes to shoot almost 41% from three-point land. Uh, and that makes life tough when you're giving up those buckets. Uh, Duke scoring 71.7 uh, points per game on the road. And this game in Louisville is actually going to be their third straight road game. As for Louisville, the defense kind of remains the constant for this program, but the offense has just been all over the place. And slow starts have kind of been the recent call for it for the Cardinals. They're scoring just 31.7 points in their first halves over the last three games compared to almost 40 points per game in the second half in that same span. Uh, you look at their last outing and it's a perfect example of this. They trailed 42-28 at Florida State at the break and then just couldn't dig themselves out of that early hole. Both Duke and Louisville sit near the bottom of the NCAA in terms of experience and it's been such a disjointed year for these young players to kind of grow up in. Um, but they got about a dozen games to find their form and, and you know, you never want to uh, count out Coach K or Coach Mack here before the ACC tournament. Well, Clemson and Florida State are both ranked in the top 25 in the coaches poll and clash in a marquee ACC matchup this Saturday as well. What do basketball betters need to look out for in this one? Well, Clemson has kind of started to stumble, lost a lot of that early season momentum thanks to an extended break. Uh, due to COVID cancellations, which allowed the Tigers on ice for about 10 days before that loss to Virginia, uh, the Tigers were the top team in defensive efficiency at Kempom, one of those important uh, metrics out there. That was before that break, and since then, they've allowed 85 points in each of their last two games against uh, UVA and Georgia Tech. Clemson allowed those opponents to shoot a collective 31 for 53. That's 58% from distance. Uh, and they just don't have the offensive firepower to kind of counter when your team, when your opponent has that hot hand. Uh, you look at Florida State, and they got to be licking their chops when they see those three-point stats. The Seminoles shooting nearly 38% from outside this season. That includes a 53% red-hot clip from beyond the arc right now in their last three games, and all of those games were wins. Um, the big thing for Florida State in this span has just been quick starts. The Knowles have been able to put up first half tallies of 42, 41, and 57 points during this winning streak. And Clemson has kind of been stuck in mud in those opening 20 minutes. They're aver averaging just 28 points in their first halves over the last three outings. So I, I like the Knowles here. And Georgia Tech is rolling. Brings a five-game win streak to Charlottesville to play the Virginia Cavaliers. What's behind the red-hot play of the Yellow Jackets? And can they pull off the upset over Tony Bennett and the Cavs? 
you would think a seven, 17 day layoff would kind of, you know, accumulate maybe a little bit of rust for Josh Passner's team, but the Jackets came out firing, uh, firing against uh, Clemson on Wednesday. Uh, Georgia Tech is great at creating chaos this season. They're forcing 16 and a half turnovers per game. They've forced a total of 135 turnovers in their last eight outings, and they've converted those mistakes into 164 points. So those are easy buckets when you're getting those points off of turnovers. But before we buy into Georgia Tech here, let's note that they've played on the road just twice this season. Uh, one of those was a loss at Florida State. And this trip to Virginia is going to be their first away game since December 15th. You look at Virginia, uh, which has been on a bit of an extended break as well, too, after its matchup with NC State was postponed due to COVID issues. Uh, and those were with the COVID issues with the Wolfpack. Uh, they're the second best team in the country at limiting their turnovers. They average only 8.2 turnovers per game. Uh, thanks to that methodical pace on offense. So they're not going to give away much here to Georgia Tech. And, and speaking of this offense for, for Virginia, uh, the Cavs have just poured in the points here. Scores of 80 and 85 points in their past two games. That 85-50 smashing of Clemson was actually the highest point total in an ACC game for a Tony Bennett-led Virginia team. Uh, to boot UVA is just shooting well from the field, and including by, beyond the arc. They've knocked down 27 of their 51 three-point attempts. That's 53% from beyond the arc in those last two games. So I'm going to lean to the home side here on Saturday and go with the Cavs. He's uh, keeping us out of trouble with the bookies. It's Jason Logan at Covers.com. Thanks for hanging out, Jason. And thanks for joining us. That wasn't weird at all what you just saw. This is Chase for the Championship. Remember, you can watch a new episode every Thursday night at 7. And until next week, man, get out there and watch some basketball. See you next Thursday.